Hello and welcome to GameSec. It's time once again to take a look at some games that most people overlook or perhaps don't even know about. And all of these games in this episode are definitely worth a closer look because at the very least, they're interesting. And some of these games were suggested by you guys because I, like everyone else, have games that I sometimes overlook for whatever reason. Anyway, let's start off with one that wasn't even released in North America. This is Gun Gage from Konami, released for the original PlayStation in 1999. At least, I think it's pronounced Gun Gage. I suppose it could be Gungage. But that reminds me of Gungan, and I don't want to think about that. Anyway, this is a third-person shooter action platformer game. This one was only released in Japan and Europe. There are several characters you can choose from, but in the beginning you can only pick one, and his name is Wakel Skade. You know what? I'll give $10 to anyone who names their kid Wakel. It has to be a human baby and on their birth certificate. Your kid is going to be the one who has to deal with it, not you. So isn't that worth $10? I think it is. Anyway, your goal in this game is to simply shoot down everything that moves and a few things that don't, but that part's optional. To do this, you have a main weapon that rapid fires if you hold down the square button. If your reticle is in the general area of the enemy, it will lock on. However, you can also hold down the L2 button to adjust your aim vertically, but you rarely ever need to do this. You also have a couple of items that you can switch between with the triangle button and use them with the circle button. For the first character, you get a shield which is mostly useless and a freeze bomb which will freeze an enemy for a bit, also mostly useless. You can strafe left and right with the L1 and R1 buttons. Double tap to dash in these directions and you definitely need to get used to doing this. Lastly, you can jump with the X button. Sometimes the game might ask you to do a little platforming and unfortunately this is where the game is most broken. The jumping segments feel like afterthoughts because it's quite difficult to aim your character. Not only that, but the controls are extremely slow and do not feel very responsive at all. To top it all off, it doesn't even support analog controls despite rumble being included. It kind of feels like you're playing the entire game in a bog that's slowing you down as you'll be pressing pretty hard on the D-pad, hoping to move at least a little bit faster. Still though, with all that said, this game can be incredibly fun. It's always enjoyable shooting down your enemies and exploring around each area. You basically need to make your way through the stage where a boss awaits. Some of the stages can be rather maze-like or even extremely open with lots of fog. It's up to you to find out where you need to go. Along the way, there will be various things for you to collect, like gems or even flowers. Getting a certain number of flowers can unlock things like a sound test. And that's good because the music in this game is outstanding. I've been listening to the music from this game since probably the year 2000 or so. I never actually played the game until much, much later than that. Remember back when you could count on Konami to almost always have amazing music in pretty much every game? Hell, remember when Konami made good games? Or even games, period? This title can seem pretty tough the first time you encounter a new boss or a level. Fortunately, you have unlimited continues, so you have plenty of time to figure things out. One of the toughest times I had was in this desert where it drops you in the middle of a bunch of tanks that are all trying to kill you any way they can. Your life bar generally can't take a lot of punishment, and these tanks are always on your ass no matter what you do. Of course, I eventually got past it. Unfortunately, the graphics seem extremely rough, even for the PlayStation. Everything is blocky, which is to be expected, but the warping of the textures is quite severe in this title. There's not really much complex geometry or effects here, so I was sad to see that the game tops out at 30 frames per second maximum with dips here and there. But at least the different stages have a lot of variety between them. Basically, I think that this game could have used a bit more love during development to iron out some of the minor issues here and there. Maybe if it had gotten released in North America, it would have been popular enough to warrant a sequel which could have been truly amazing. I guess, sadly, we'll never know. Still, play this game if you can, it's worth it. Next, let's check out Tech Romancer from Capcom for the Sega Dreamcast. This is a 3D fighting game that was originally released in the arcades in 1988 and on the Dreamcast in 2000. In this one, you choose from one of nine mechs to control. A few of them even let you choose who the pilot actually is. 
The premise is fairly simple, defeat your enemy twice to win the match. However, here you're filling up your opponent's damage meter instead of depleting their life bar. Once either you or the enemy has a full damage gauge, the announcer shouts, EXTREME IMPACT! And you both are reset to continue the match. EXTREME IMPACT! If you can damage your opponent's armor to 0%, then suddenly each hit you land causes a bit more damage. Once the damage meter has been filled twice on either fighter, the match ends and the other character wins. Critical impact! Now, since this is a 3D fighting game, the controls are a bit different than your typical Capcom fighter. You can run in pretty much any direction using either the analog stick or the D-pad. Since this is a fighting game, I preferred using the D-pad myself. However, that means you can't jump or block using the D-pad like you can in most other fighting games. So those moves are, unsurprisingly, mapped to their very own buttons. You also have a single attack button. However, you can press attack in conjunction with any of the other buttons like guard or jump to pull off a few different moves. The Dreamcast version, of course, lets you map some of these combos to a particular button if you want. At first, I struggled a bit getting used to it, but it didn't take long before the controls felt second nature. Once that happens, the game becomes immensely fun, as most Capcom fighting games tend to be. Occasionally, items will appear on the playfield that you can collect and then use to enhance your abilities. There's a story mode where each character has their own scenario that they play through. This adds to the replayability for sure, and I always like this feature in fighting games. Mainly because I usually play in single player mode. The stories here aren't deep by any means, but that's fine. You can also play in hero mode where you need to take down all 12 robots to become the champion and you don't need to deal with any of the story cutscenes. This is great for after you've beaten all of the story modes and don't need to see those anymore. Overall, the graphics are decent to good, but I am a bit disappointed that this game only runs at 30 frames per second most of the time. There's not a lot going on here, so it's really surprising. Each of the robots look good, though some of them are pretty goofy. Hell, this one has his own nutsack. I feel that there could be a larger variety in the scenes that you fight in as well. The sound and music are both mostly pretty good. However, there are a few sound effects in here that are too loud and sound kind of annoying. The good thing is that the announcer is the same guy from Street Fighter Alpha 3. This is a really fun game to play. It was likely overlooked because of the incredibly stupid name this game has. Techromancer does not sound like a fun robot one-on-one -on -one fighting game. It sounds like a weepy RPG for people who get way too much into their on-screen characters. I mean, imagine asking your friend, Hey buddy, you wanna play some Tech Romancer? Yeah, I don't think so buddy, you go have fun with that. But now that you know what it is, you should definitely give it a try. Hey, I know, I know. I've only been showing games that have polygons so far. Boo! That's not retro enough. 2D only. Well, you might like this next game then, because it's even less retro. This one is called Chaos Legion. It's from Capcom and only available on the PlayStation 2, and also on the PC. This one was suggested in the comments of the last criminally overlooked video. And while this game definitely is overlooked, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a great game. It does have a ton of potential though. The story is rather nonsensical. Basically, you're a dude and you're after another dude, but there's some atonement involved and you know what? I really don't care. All I care about is how well this action game plays. And for the most part, it plays pretty well, honestly. This is a 3D hack and slash. It's one of those games where you're locked in an area until you defeat all of the enemies in that space. Then the door unlocks and you move on to the next. It's also one of those games where you get a little something from the enemy after you kill it. Nothing really new here at all. However, I generally really like these kinds of games. You have a soul meter which gathers strength as you kill enemies. At first, when you press the triangle button when it's full, you unleash a crazy thing which does a ton of damage. This goes away after the prologue because of course it does. After this, you collect crests, two of which can be equipped at any time. You can switch between them with the L2 button during gameplay. 
When you press the triangle button, you get a quick burst style of attack, just as long as you have enough stock in your soul meter. If you press L1, you get two or three ghost dudes which will hang around with you. Generally, they will attack on their own, but you can make them attack more and focus them with the triangle button. The more you use them, the more experience they'll get. Between stages, you decide how to power them up with that experience. As for you, you don't have many other moves on your own other than a sword slash and a jump. You're a basic bitch if there ever was one. The game starts out stupid easy, and while it never becomes what I'd call difficult, it does become extremely arduous. It feels more like a chore, and you'd just rather have fun instead. I mean, who wouldn't? Each scene is a small area that you have to pass, and even if you do, no checkpoints for you. That means if you die after playing a stage for 15 or 20 minutes, it's all the way back to the beginning, spending tons of time killing thousands of enemies all over. There really are a ton of enemies. You will not be zipping through any of the stages here. I'd honestly rather go to work, punch in, and do repetitious tasks for 8 hours than play stage 3. At least I get something from going to work. If you die in this stage, the only thing you get is wasted life that you can never get back. You could have spent that time in your life with your friends, loved ones, or even scooping cat poop. But instead, that part of your life will forever be wasted on not quite getting to the boss. If you do make it to the boss though, at least there is a checkpoint there. If you have nothing in your life outside of video games, then you might enjoy this one a little more. The storytelling is kind of funny. Here, they're talking about how a town was recently destroyed, but there are no bodies, not even a blood stain. There aren't any bodies, none at all, not even a blood stain. But then, not even five or ten seconds later, they're talking about a literal blood stain in the town. Also, sometimes the voiceover doesn't match the text. The dark, insidious malice awaits the night. The visuals are your standard PlayStation 2 fare. They certainly aren't bad, but there's lots of grays, not much color, they're often dark, plenty of jaggies, but at least we usually get 60 fields per second. The music on the other hand is usually pretty good and it helps keep you excited. Unless you're replaying a stage and then you're just going to be annoyed no matter what. If only they had spent a bit more time with the design of this one, I think we could have had a real winner. Still, I think a sequel or a remake could fix up a lot of what went wrong here. I'd like to see a less convoluted between stage screen where you can level stuff up, more variety, and at least some checkpoints. Well Capcom, the ball is in your court now. This is Jurassic Park for the Sega Master System. It was also released on the Game Gear. But screw the Game Gear, I want to play it on the Master System here. You play as Sam Neill's character, Dr. Alan Grant. Basically, the plot is the same as the movie and even the book. You fly to the island via helicopter where you're informed that many deaths are happening each day as a result of the dinosaurs who have broken through the electric fence. You also discover that it's your job to herd the dinosaurs back where they need to be in different spots throughout the island. The game lets you pick from the first four areas to start in. After that, you find yourself in a jeep, gunning down various dinosaurs who hurl themselves at you. You control the reticle and fire to defend the jeep and kill the dinos. Every hundred feet or so will be a small obstacle in the road that makes your jeep bounce. The only purpose of these is to make your reticle bounce around and prevent you from shooting for a short time. They didn't want this to be too easy. You can't shoot the things that are in the road to prevent this, you'll just have to deal with it. Once you get so far, there will be a boss dinosaur whose life you need to end. If you're able to get past this, you get out of your jeep and hoof it the rest of the way. Now you're in your typical side-scrolling action stage. You run left and right, jump and shoot. You can also hang from any ledges by holding the jump button and pressing up. Or at least that's how I do it. You can traverse left or right with ease, just like Sam Neill did in all of the Jurassic Park movies he's been in. Basically, you're shooting the dinosaurs so that you can steal the money that they drop. Some of the lower class dinosaurs only drop coins, but the higher class ones drop full bags of money. There are several scenes in each stage to get through. Eventually, you'll encounter a boss. You may think that you get to murder him and take his money, but you'd sadly be mistaken. When you beat him, you're informed that he's been captured. Now that that stage has been cleared, you're free to choose where to go next. Each area is more or less set up in the same fashion. 
Honestly, sometimes I forget that I'm playing the game because I think that I'm watching the movie. If you press the convenient pause button on your Master System console, you gain access to the weapon select screen. The problem is, is that these other two weapons suck ass. Yeah, check this out. Why would I ever need to use this? Screw that. The graphics are generally pretty good for this system. There's lots of tile animations like ground that moves when you walk over it. There's even some nice parallax scrolling in some areas. The sound is decent for the console. The music isn't phenomenal or anything, but at least it's not annoying. Trust me when I say it could be much, much worse. I rarely ever hear anyone mention this game, and I think a lot of that is because it was exclusively on the Game Gear in most of the world, and that's a system that just really never caught on. The Master System version was only released in Europe, and maybe Brazil, and Australia. I'm sure you'll let me know. Also, this game was released way late in the console's life, so that's likely another reason it gets overlooked. This is definitely worth a play though, so check it out. It's about a billion times better than the Sega CD Jurassic Park game. This next game I've always been kind of curious about, but I never really had any ambition to actually sit down and spend some time with it. Well, I did for this episode, and you know what? I'm glad I did. I like it. Elemental Gimmick Gear from Birthday is a game that seems to never get mentioned by anyone. This is an exclusive title for the Dreamcast. Before we get into it, look at this, what the hell? Why is this 9 a different font than the other 9s on the screen? Someone please explain this. Anyway, this one is an overhead action RPG game. Basically, you've been on Earth sleeping in your little pod called an Elemental Gimmick Gear or Egg. Society studies your technology while you remain asleep for over a hundred more years. It turns out that you're at least 6,000 years old and nobody knows anything about you. Suddenly, some weird stuff happens which would annoy me if I tried to explain it. It's your typical Japanese RPG story stuff. That all wakes you up and of course you have no memory, I mean why would you? So you hop into your old egg that you were discovered in and now you're off to save the entire world. Along the way, you hope to get your memory back. You travel around most places in your egg, but there are times where you need to hop out to proceed, usually into someone's house. You have a punch button, but it's extremely slow since he has to pull back on his arm before he launches it forward. This gives a very noticeable delay from when you press the attack button to when you actually attack. Not sure why anyone thinks this is a good idea, but I think some people do like it. Maybe it's just me, but I like to attack when I press attack. Am I in the wrong here? You can also roll up into a ball and move around this way. This strains your life for some very strange reason. This is also very slow because you need to wait for the animation to complete before you can move around, and when you're playing the game, it feels a lot slower than it does watching me play it. Anyway, you wander around attacking enemies with your extremely short reach. Enemies usually drop stuff including currency, money, and later gems to fill up your special attacks. You traverse through huge dungeons with basic puzzle solving elements very similar to Zelda. As you can see, when you fight the basic enemies, it's done in the overhead style just like everything else. However, for boss fights, it goes into a full polygonal 3D mode. Neat, I guess, but I swear the controls feel even a bit more laggy and slow here. Anyone else notice that? There are lots of NPCs to talk to and typical RPG town stuff to do. The text draws on screen pretty slow. You can set it to fast, but it's a lie. There is no fast text anywhere here. My last major complaint would be the excessive load times going through doors or switching screens. The screen stays black for what seems like an eternity waiting for the new screen to appear. Optimized, this game is not. I read that this was originally developed for the Saturn and then got moved to the Dreamcast, so that may be why. Despite all of my nitpicks though, this is still quite an addictive game to play for some reason. In fact, I had a hard time putting this one down. It's especially fun to backtrack a little bit when you get new powers to explore new areas. You'll often see things that you can't get past yet and then wonder what you'll need to get by. The game can be frustrating sometimes because often it doesn't take many hits for you to die, and the further you get, the less life refills the enemies seem to drop. 
I swear, this boss took me forever because the little segments just kept coming and coming. And of course, the bosses have no life bar, so you don't know how well you're doing. Still, I had to keep trying until I got past it, which of course I did. The 2D graphics here are incredibly good. They're definitely low resolution for the Dreamcast, but still nice with sharp pixels. The artwork feels like a comic book style with lots of cool colors. Many of the sprites look pre-rendered. And that right there would kind of go with this game originally being made for the Saturn because that was all the rage back then. The music fits the game extremely well and is some fairly high quality stuff. I do wish that they had tweaked the control a bit more, but otherwise this game is great. The name of the game, Elemental Gimmick Gear, is kind of dumb though. It always makes me think of Elemental Gear Bolt on the PlayStation and it's nothing like that. Besides the dumb name, I doubt this game had much in the way of marketing. Oh well, it's tough, but it's definitely not a bad game at all. Let's check out Omega Boost on the original PlayStation, released by Sony in 1999. This one was developed by Polyphony Digital, who is probably best known for Motor Tune Grand Prix. I guess they also make something called Gran Turismo, but nobody's ever heard of that. Anyway, this is the only game that they've ever done which isn't about racing cars. Must have felt really strange for them. It reminds me of Panzer Dragoon in some ways. Let's get one thing out of the way right now, this isn't as good as Panzer Dragoon. But one of the designers of the second Panzer Dragoon game did work on this one. Obviously, the game takes place in 1946. I mean, you can just tell by looking at it. Actually, you're a dude in a mech that's traveled back in time to prevent something or other. It doesn't really matter much as the story doesn't affect the gameplay in the least. I do like that the FMV sequences have real living human beings in them. It's easy to forget that this used to be a big thing on the Sega CD, but it was kind of strange to see in the 32-bit area, especially in a game coming from Japan. Anyway, unlike Panzer Dragoon, this game isn't on rails. Honestly, this one also reminds me of a simplified Zone of the Enders before Zone of the Enders existed. Maybe that's a better comparison. You can more or less fly anywhere you want, but you can't really go far away from the action. An arrow in the lower left of the screen points in the direction that the enemies are in. It's really easy to read this instead of getting lost in 3D space like so many other games. You can press the attack button for a quick rapid burst of shots and these work extremely well. But you can also hold the button to lock onto a bunch of targets and then release powerful lasers to wreck their lives. You have a boost button so you can boost out of the way of enemy fire. This becomes more and more important the further you get into the game. You can also hold the R1 button to stop moving and attack the enemy from where you are. This can be quite helpful in a few different situations. Lastly, you can sometimes use a bomb attack and really take a big chunk out of the enemy. This is best saved for the last boss on any given stage. You have a life bar and some bosses can make short work of it. You only have one life and a few continues, and when you do continue, you restart the entire stage. This feels like an easy game, but the challenge soon ramps up. Stage 4 is the one that will really start to teach you that you should be boosting if you want to survive. The game controls well, and if you press the analog button on your controller, you can control it that way as well. In fact, the game plays super nice with the analog controls. It feels immensely good and fast. Here's the thing though. Starting in stage four, the game would shut off the analog for no reason. It would be working fine and then maybe I'd take a hit or something and then I'd find myself unable to control my mech. I'd look down at the controller and the analog had turned off. I'd have to turn it back on again. This happened many, many times during stage four and after. I ended up just having to use the D-pad. It must be a bug or something that occasionally pops up. Unfortunately, playing with a D-pad is decidedly less fun, but it is still fun, don't get me wrong. The graphics are sparse, but good. It runs at a locked 30 frames per second, but honestly, I swear sometimes it feels a bit smoother. The enemy designs all look nice. The music is pretty cool as well, with lots of high energy tracks. Definitely seek this one out if you haven't played it and pray that the analog disabling bug doesn't happen to you. Seriously, has anyone else ever experienced that?
Okay, I've got two more games to show you for today, and this next one is for the NES. And it kind of amazes me how many NES games are still out there that I haven't gotten around to playing yet for some reason. Anyway, let's check it out. Here's Clash at Demon Head from Vic Tokai for the NES. I've never heard anyone talk about this game, though I do remember the ad that ran all the time in gaming magazines. This is a quest platformer if there is such a genre. Maybe non-linear action-adventure platformer is a better description. Your character is named Bang, yeah, and he's on vacation with his girlfriend. Gee, I wonder what he's doing with his girlfriend. Suddenly, he's contacted about Professor Plum. Now he's off to save the professor as well as the entire world. You're presented with a map with branching paths that pretty much go everywhere. Before each stage, you can select which path you want to go down. Playing the stages consists of running, jumping, and shooting just like Mega Man, but at least in this game you can crouch. You collect various things from defeated enemies like money, hearts, and apples. Money gives you money just like you'd expect. Hearts restore your life also just like you'd expect. Apples increase your force level. More on that nonsense later. You'll encounter many characters which prompts a screen called Talking Time where the conversations take place. They'll either tell or beg you to go to a certain numbered route. The problem is, is that the map doesn't show you which numbers are where except in the intersection that you're at, so that kinda sucks. You have to draw your own map or maybe subscribe to Nintendo Power if you didn't already miss the issue before you got the game. Oh well, if you did, just pay the fee to call Nintendo's counselors and ask them, I guess. Your parents won't mind. Sometimes you can call a shop where you can buy things. You can see what everything does, but not everything is for sale just yet. The items that you can get right away are boots for jumping higher and running faster, as well as a suit to make navigating water easier and harmless. These all have their own life meter, of course, and you can't use them indefinitely. Unfortunately, I was only ever able to call the shop once. No matter what I did, I was never able to get it to appear again. I am clearly missing something. There's a password feature here, and I was only able to call it down once as well. This game is extremely cryptic in that regard, like a lot of questionably designed NES games were. I suppose if I had the manual, things would probably be a lot more clear. Now you see why people like buying these older games complete? Of course, I suppose I could always cheat and look at game facts or something. Either way, I can't think of how this makes the game more fun than, say, if the shop and password were accessible at any time on the map screen. Anyway, you go back and forth and eventually you fight some boss and earn some powers. Like the power to shrink into areas where you couldn't go before. Here's the thing, though. You need a certain amount of force to use these powers. You get forced by picking up the apples that some enemies drop, and they don't drop them often. So even though you've earned the new power, you can't use it at any time you want. I think that the game would actually be more fun without having to worry about force. In fact, it might even start approaching the fun factor of something like Wonder Boy 3 The Dragon's Trap on the Master System. Both the graphics and the sound are average for the system, and not annoying or ugly at all. Still, this game is definitely worth trying out. I think that a lot of the design decisions come from game developers just not being as experienced designing things like this in general back then. So you really can't hold these flaws against the game too much. However, if you're like me and you're just now getting into it, these are things you might notice. Check it out if you're up for some really old school fun. How about Stubbs the Zombie and Rebel Without a Pulse for the original Xbox, Mac, and PC? And of course, I'm playing on the Xbox here. In this game, you actually get to play as the zombie. It all takes place in a very 1950s or 60s looking environment where scientists wantonly run many different experiments of questionable morality. For seemingly no reason whatsoever, you suddenly crawl out of the ground and you just want to wreak some havoc and eat some brains. Mmm, brains. This is generally pretty easy to do. Just press Y if you're close enough and you'll eat some brains. After a few seconds, that person also becomes a zombie and will hunt down their own brains to eat. Soon, you'll be in control of your own zombie army and this can be helpful since you can use them as human shields. Well, maybe not human shields. The other zombies can really help you out because cops will shoot at them as well as you. That way you don't have to take the brunt of it all. Run too far away from your pack and they'll stop helping you. You'll be fighting a lot of cops here and you can't just walk up to them and eat their brains if they have their guns pulled. You can either get them from behind or you can attack them a few times until they weaken up enough for you to taste their delicious gray matter. 
You can also do a zombie fart attack because I guess that's what zombies are known to do. I don't know. But this stuns living things so that you can sneak up behind them and, you guessed it, eat their brains. You can also toss some spare organs which explode like gas grenades. The story is pretty crazy. There's a futuristic town built by the world's richest human with everything being his idea of what the 21st century will be like. He's getting ready to open the city when you arrive and you're ruining his day. For some reason, his new city, which he purports to be crime-free, has about 6 billion police officers who you'll have to contend with and probably eat. When you finally see the richest human in the world's mom, you fall in love. She's quickly whisked away for her safety and you make it your goal to pursue her. Could you have known each other when you were alive? Hmm. Stubbs himself is always smoking a cigarette. It never runs out and he never needs to relight it. It also never gets bent out of shape from munching on people's skulls. Stubbs controls fairly well, kind of like a third person shooter with one stick to move and the other to aim. The stages can be pretty large with ambiguous goals. There's even a part in the game where Stubbs detaches his arm and you, the player, get to control it. You can affix yourself to other people's heads and control them. Be careful though as you'll be shot dead pretty quickly unless you're controlling someone who can fight back, like another cop. The graphics are decent, though not especially noteworthy. It can even get kind of dark in spots. But hey, at least the game runs in 480p. As far as the sound quality goes, it's pretty typical stuff. There's some covers of music from the 50s in here, but not a whole lot else, though sometimes some average music might play during a stage. Overall, it's a good package with some great humor, though the humor isn't gonna be stuff that little kids will appreciate. I'm just saying. Supposedly, a sequel was planned, but it unfortunately never happened. This is a good game, but I think this could be a great modern game if they fleshed it out a bit more. Sorry, I just had to. I can't walk! Officer down! Way down! I'm bringing you in. Something broken. This isn't you! Hurt, honey! Spit that out! Damn it! There you go, those are some more games that you might want to check out. Now regardless if I think they're the bee's knees or not, that doesn't mean these games should be left to obscurity. In fact, each and every one of these titles has some promising concepts at the very least. Anyway, what are some games that you think are overlooked? Let me know, and in the meantime, thank you for watching GameSec. Hello, and welcome back to Literacy Corner. In today's episode, I will be reading the back of the box to Insector X on the 16-bit Sega Genesis. So grab your copy of Insector X and read along. <clears throat> Insector X. They're gonna bug you. To death. Compared to these guys, killer bees are about as scary as a butterfly. In this awesome insect empire, you've got to be a fast gun. No can of bug spray will help you here. These giant mechanized insects mean business. Become too enthralled with a beautiful landscape and your daydreams could become a nightmare. Become Insector X. A moment's delay could be your last. One player. Sega Genesis, 16-bit cartridge. Sega and Genesis are trademarks of Sega Enterprises Limited. Copyright, Taito Corporation, 1989. Copyright and trademark. Sage's Creation, 
Incorporated. 714-373-9136. Valley View ST250, Garden Grove, California, 92645. Sage's Creation, trademark. Made in Japan. 7 2 1 3 3 7 1 0 0 0 1